This program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest UCTV programs. All right, today we have Mark Douglas uh, with us. He is the founder, the CTO, and the president of Steelhouse. Mark brings 20 years of product development experience into Steelhouse. Um, and one thing that's um, been consistent with Mark's career is he's always worked with top-notch technology, which he's largely helped develop, and he's always applied it into emerging markets. So this is a guy that likes to go into markets that didn't exist before with technology that didn't exist before. As an entrepreneur, I can tell you that's hard, but often a very lucrative way to go. He started his entrepreneurial career as a teenager in Silicon Valley at Oracle. Um, he was part of the founding team of Oracle Applications Division, which is now a multi-billion dollar company. He went on from there and, and founded several successful companies. This isn't a one-trick pony, a guy that got lucky. This is someone who's done it over and over again. Two of those companies went public, um, and two of them he sold to um, large companies, and, such as Informix Software and VMware, both very successful software companies. He's also the, um, been the VP of Technology at eHarmony, where he was there four years, and he built the personality matching technology that basically sends the right picture to you once they start to figure out the kind of people you want to date. Um, I'm simplifying it tremendously, but there's a lot of complex software and algorithms behind uh, that technology. He was also instrumental in driving um, the adoption of that company's technology, so getting people to subscribe to that business. Um, lots of, of marketing tips and tricks um, that he created over his four-year tenure and helped build it into one of the most recognizable brands in the country. Right before he started Steelhouse, uh, Mark was the VP of Engineering at Rubicon Project. Maybe not a household name for you guys, but definitely um, a well-respected, well-known ad tech company um, in, the, in the tech world. Ru uh, Rubicon's been doing a lot of uh, cutting edge stuff from a technology standpoint. So Mark at Steelhouse has built a company that's really on fire. I was just chatting with him a little bit before, um, before um, we started here. He's been talking to 26 different top-notch venture capital firms. 23 of them look like um, they're very, very interested. Um, and now he's in the process of doing all the follow-up. You can imagine when you have 20-some uh, investors interested in working with your company, the amount of follow-up that that requires, on top of running a business that's growing um, daily. So he's a super um, uber busy guy with a lot of irons in the fire. He's essentially taking um, uh, almost a full day out of his schedule to come and talk to us here, drove up from uh, LA. So let's give him a warm welcome. Thank you. I should have gotten some water while I was over there, but I'll, I'll start now. So um, John just stole my thunder in terms of how I like to describe, talk about my career. But um, so thanks for being here. Um, I'm not going to deliver slides. I start, I'm going to just kind of tell a little bit more about my background and kind of share some of the lessons I learned along the way. So like John said, I, I started my tech career in, um, it's a little frightening to say, probably before a few, some of you were born, so in 1985. <laughs> that, that was the scariest day of my life when I hired somebody who um, was born um, after I graduated from high school, so that, <laughs> that 
<laughs> so that was kind of scary. But the, um, yeah, so I started, I'm a college dropout, sorry to say, and if you spend too much time around me, you will drop out of college. <laughs> 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 so my daughter has not graduated, one of my two daughters has not graduated, and um, um, I have, have someone else in my life who, who was in college and dropped out of college once she met me. So I don't advocate that path, but it does tend to happen. And um, so I learned a lot um, kind of along the way in my career. So I, I dropped out of college and um, I started to learn, I started to teach myself to program. It just happened to be a time um, where a lot of people do that now. Not a lot of people had done it at the time. And that led eventually, um, I was in New York, I grew up in New York City, that led eventually to me um, getting connected with Oracle when Oracle was a startup. And, the, um, and so I moved out to the Bay Area. I didn't know, I, I remember flying out to San Francisco. I didn't know San Francisco was Silicon Valley. So I had no, I just knew I was going to San Francisco and you know, it seemed like a great place to go. And so I got there and um, met um, a bunch of people, a bunch of people who are, are you know, Larry Ellison's obviously a really recognizable name, you know, met Larry, met some other people, and went to work kind of building um, Oracle's applications division. And it's the first, um, and, th and then I was at Oracle for five years, and I left, and I always in my life had kind of had a, a, a kind of an inkling to want to build something, and, and I also always had been somewhat business-minded, so why not build a business, right? And the, um, so I eventually left Oracle after five years. It's funny because I'll meet people who we'll run into and we'll find out we both worked at Oracle and they'll say, oh, I was at Oracle back in the day and I'm like, when were you there? And they'll be like, 1998. And I'll be like, oh, I was there in 1989. Like, like, <laughs> so it's the, um, but after five years, I learned at Oracle, well, I learned a ton of lessons. So I, I got there and we were started the applications division at Oracle. And when I started, it was just me and a few other people. And I started writing code. I started literally first line of code, Oracle Apps Division, started writing. And we needed to hire um, a lot of people. We hired 300 people the first year. So that division really, it really grew very quickly. And they were all college students. They were all people who had just graduated college. And which was great because I got, I, you know, was made a man, like someone had to manage someone, so I was made a manager. And so by the end of the year, I had 75 people working for me. And I thought, wow, isn't this great? It's really easy to manage people because, but I didn't realize that all those college students hadn't fully recognized they had left college yet. And so I was handing out assignments and they were getting them done like this. And then I started building a real company, and then I found out people don't do that. They actually have to be managed, and managing really sucks. <laughs> yeah. And so, but the um, thing that I learned um, at Oracle was um, that I applied to the first company I did. So I left Oracle, I started a company called Centerview, and venture funded, raised money from um, two, two um, venture capital firms in Silicon Valley. And I quickly realized I didn't know how to build a business, that I abs really didn't know what I was doing. I had learned a lot of lessons at Oracle, but the, um, in retrospect, the, and the business turned out successfully. Three years later, I mean, successful was we had an exit. After three years of running that business, I didn't feel like showing up to work anymore. It was like, real, like it was a really tough, you know, all these things you hear about um, the market product fit and, and, and trying, to, trying to get that right and figuring out all the financial piece and stuff like that. It was all very difficult. And what the first lesson I realized is that I, is if, when I wish I had gone to another startup before I did a startup, and a really good one. Because Oracle was a startup, but we were, I joined like, I was like the 300th person there, and it, 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 it was heading very, very rapidly towards like 5,000 people. So it was not, it, it, it wasn't quite day one, um, but it was early. And I wound up recognizing, and this is advice that I would give to all you, it's not advice that you strictly have to follow, but that the, I would have saved a lot of time in the first company 
that I was able to start if I had gone to a company that was early stage run by someone that had already started one. And that I, the, because the, um, despite what John would tell you, if you're ever in a position to raise money from, from a firm like, like the firm he works at, VCs spend about four hours a month thinking about your company. Maybe. Maybe. <laughs> so, and it's funny to watch new entrepreneurs worry about board meetings and hear people say, you know, you know, well, we're going to wait to see what the board decides. Really, like you're going so you got a guy or a girl that spends four hours a month max thinking about your business and you're going to make have them make decisions for you like that's just absolutely crazy. And so so you don't really truly get a lot of advice from VCs. They have a great network and they will help as much as they can, but the first thing is you have to know what to ask for. The um, they they are not like like trying to run your business. That you have to run your business. And so if you have an opportunity to join a business and to see someone successfully build it, um, there's a lot to learn from that. And that, that was kind of, I actually, when I look back, even though the company had a successful exit, I consider it the first big mistake that I made kind of in my career. And, um, and it's kind of the first lesson. Now, the big, the, now at Oracle, I did learn the, what, what, was amazing, what was amazing about Oracle, and now it would be Google or Facebook or any, you know, hopefully Steelhouse, um, any of these companies, was I learned how valuable it is to hire talented people, how nothing trumps that. And experience is very overrated. Um, and that, that, that we always talked about, like at Oracle, we always talked about hiring athletes, and they took it seriously. Like we would literally hire Olympic athletes and, the, and like go search for them and try to hire them. But so they, they took it very literal. But, the, the, but, you know, just hiring smart young people. Our hiring process at Steelhouse now, we are at this point hiring a lot of people who are recent college grads or um, the, or if they spend too much time for me, recent college dropouts. And, the, the, and um, our hiring process is we're looking for GPA, um, absolutely. Um, we're looking, we, we ask for writing samples. We have a, per, you have the person take a personality profile so we can ha get a little bit better understanding of the personality. And we don't look, the, the GPA, we don't ask people their GPA for the re and no one asks for your GPA when you leave college and go get a job. It, it uh, may be IBM or something like that. But the, you walk in a store, I'm not going to ask you what's your GPA generally. But at, at Oracle, we did. And at, I'm sure I think at Facebook and Google and these companies that hire large amounts of talent, um, it's really important. It doesn't indicate intelligence. It indicates discipline. Like, you, it like how, or were you disciplined enough to set a goal to go to college and actually come out of it? <laughs> With a, with, with a GPA that reflects the effort. And, and, and that's, wh that's why we want to know your GPA. The writing sample indicates intelligence. You cannot teach writing to someone once they're an adult. And people who tend to be t good writers tend to be fairly intelligent. And that's why we want the writing samples. So, and this is the kind of lessons I learned that now you would probably learn at a Facebook or, G or Google and the kind of lessons I, I learned at, at um, Oracle and, um, and, and applied to businesses um, beyond that. I learned to not ask people to work hard, but instead give them challenges that kind of, um, that they can't stop working hard because they're so loving what they're doing. I cringe when I hear about someone who says, I, I had, the, 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 the answer to most questions is, to me is often really obvious and people don't want to face it. I had someone that worked for me at my, um, at Centerview, which is the first startup I did. And um, he came to me one day, he was like vice president. I don't, we don't really use titles in, in, in Steelhouse. I've kind of moved, I kind of don't focus too much on titles anymore, I focus on roles. But at the time he was like VP of client services and he came to me and he said, the um, people are not including me in meetings and I feel left out, and they're not asking me my advice. 
you know, and I need your help, you know, I, I don't understand why. And I said to him, well, maybe they don't think you have anything valuable to say. <laughs> like, it, 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 it's, it, like, what, the, what do you want me to do about that other than maybe you shouldn't be working here, right? <laughs> so, and very shortly after, he wasn't. The, 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 so he wrote his own death notice. But the, um, like, the, the, when you're building a company, there, there's no, magic to it. I mean, there is, there, there, there's no magic in the sense that the answers are in front of you. Um, you got to confront the reality. Um, you have to, um, the, 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 you, 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 you just have to um, be very logical. One of the things I do in my company, I know I'm kind of all over the map here, but the, one of the things I do at Steelhouse is I, I have a belief that, um, if you get a group of people, this, this group of people together, and everyone, and, and everyone has the same information, like, like I don't want to make every decision. I want the people that, that work on the team to, make, to be able to make decisions. So well, the first part of that is, well, actually, let me back up. People usually think they disagree over decisions. No, you disagree over the criteria for making the decision. Because if I give you the same information, and we have the same criteria, and, we're lar and we have something shared, I mean, it's an intelligent group of people, something shared, we will likely arrive at the same conclusion. And so what that does that drive, that drives ev is everyone needs to know everything, or at least everything about the area that they're focused on and that they're making decisions on and things like that. So I take that to heart. I mean, I'm, I'm starting to consider filming my board meetings so I can just publish them to the rest of the company because it's like there are no secrets. You, you, like, like everyone should know this stuff. So I'm really all about everyone knows everything that everyone else knows. And so all of us are capable of a right. And, and then the key is, is let's all understand what the goals are and the criteria is so that we can very easily generally arrive at the same, same conclusions. And so again, I'm kind of providing some, some insights, some things I learned along the way. Um, these are some of the ones that, by being at a company like Oracle and now, or Facebook, or Google, or, or probably a LinkedIn, um, some of the things, lessons I learned that were incredibly valuable in my career, and I've applied over and over and over again. And I am an advisor to a couple of companies now, and in every case where the founder of that company has not had the opportunity to work in an environment like that where there's that quality of leadership, they are struggling on really basic things like hiring and, and, and finance and, and um, setting goals and things like that. It is just incredibly valuable to treat those companies. It's like in Israel, you do two years in the military, everyone should do two years at Facebook if you can. And, and kind of like, and, and just pick up all these lessons and then go out and apply it if, if, if you have the opportunity. It's not strictly required, but I know for me, it would have, um, I, I would have not, it, things would have been so much harder without it. So, you know, I tried to apply those lessons at Centerview, and then I learned the next lesson, which was um, product market fit. You know, the, the old saying is, well, the dogs eat the dog food. It sounds kind of not good to call your customers dogs, but in some cases, your customers are literally dogs, like if you're Purina. And the only way you can test your product is to put in a bowl and see if they eat it. <laughs> and, so, so, and so there's a saying in the tech industry, well, dogs eat the dog food, meaning, well, the customers actually want to buy this stuff. And is there an actual need in, the, need in the market? And what I found is when I left Oracle, I was really determined to start a company. And so, you know, I literally got in a room, and I, there, there were certain areas that I, you know, kind of gravitated towards. Centerview was a development tools company, so th this was, you know, helping you to build, build software and stuff like that. Um, and um, what I found, and the, the next lesson I learned, is that the, like, I, the best ideas are organic. Like they come to you. You don't, you don't go find them. 
And um, like one came to me when I walked in this room and I saw a line of 50 people online. I thought, man, I could start a business right there. <laughs> literally, I thought that. <laughs> because that was cra kind of crazy. You guys literally have to line up to sign in. And you all have phones in your pocket. And we could just put a couple Wi-Fi antennas in here and stuff like that. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I literally thought of business. Not necessarily a good one. I'll tell you about that in a second. But yet you need a big market. And that's probably not my big market. <laughs> the, but the, um, the best ideas are organic. Um, they come to you. They're obvious. You need to open your eyes to them. You need to see them. They're, they're, they're sitting in front of you. Um, they're not easy to spot. Um, sometimes you can spot them, and the market's not big enough. Um, or they're not sexy enough and interesting enough. Um, but, but generally speaking, um, I'm personally not a big fan of the incubator model, where you put a bunch of people in the room and they literally try to force themselves to come up with, with, with needs and ideas for businesses. It doesn't mean it's the wrong model. There are some pretty successful companies have come out of it, like Airbnb and a few others. Um, but if you hear, even in the case of Airbnb, which came out of an incubator in LA, the guy, the person, had, it was an organic idea. He, that, that, like, that person, I'm forgetting his name, he entered, Airbnb, he entered that incubator kind of already with the organic idea for Airbnb, which is basically, I need money and I want to try and sell, see if I can turn my apartment into a hotel room. And, the, um, and so even in that model, like the, the, the best ideas are, are organic. And when I read articles like in Fortune or, tech, tech, or I read on TechCrunch or something like that, and I read how people are like in those incubators and like in the span of three weeks have tried, thought through four different ideas, it just makes me cringe. And it definitely makes me that if I was an venture capitalist, I would be very unlikely to be investing. And um, again, doesn't mean that I'm an advisor in another company right now that was also, um, actually, John's an investor in it called Tracy. Tracy was here. Tracy was here. Yeah, see, her idea was like women have wedding dresses sitting in a closet. That was the original idea, and they probably are never going to wear it again, or hopefully they're not going to wear it again, right? <laughs> so, and, so, so, and, they, and, and so they could probably sell it, and then they extended that to, well, wait a second, just about everything in their closet. <laughs> they're, but they're probably not going to wear again. So that's a pretty organic idea. That's a pretty obvious idea. And that one that you know, all it took was for her to open her eyes to it and, and then capture it. The challenge, Tracy is amazing. I, I had dinner with her two nights ago. The challenge she has is she's never worked at Facebook or Google or something like that. And so I'm, ha I'm helping her, a lot of the people helping her to give her all the, it, like kind of we're trying to stuff all this like kind of experience that we picked up in companies like that. Um, that because those companies attract the world's best, best management talent. And, you, and, th and that's, that's, that's why it's so attractive to spend even a short, short stint there. So the, I, I would, um, you know, whatever business idea. So the first lesson was you might want to learn from another entrepreneur. You might want to learn from a really successful kind of growing organization, how to grow an organization. You may want to learn from another successful entrepreneur how to start a company from scratch. And then when you look to start your own company, um, you, you, it, it's probably best to, 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 to think of something that is organic. And so that's the lesson I learned at Centerview. Um, the, I sold Centerview. I took some time off. I got a pilot's license, did some flying and stuff like that, learned to scuba dive, you know, which is not two things you should do in the same day, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> so, like, you literally can die from doing that the same day. <laughs> so, um, and <laughs> I, didn't, I haven't. The, um, and so then I joined another company. And I joined a company. So Centerview, I had started. I was founder and CEO. Um, the other thing about Centerview is it's a really lonely job to be CEO. Really lonely job. I mean, I already kind of threw John under the bus telling you he's not going to give you much advice, right? <laughs> and the, the, um, he's not here to run your company. The, the, he, you know, all this fear of like the VCs and things like that, the last thing they want to do is to run your company. They, they, it's not going to happen. 
They are not going to show up one day and say, you're no longer in charge. I'm going to take things over. It's not going to happen at all. So, um, so I went to another company. I like challenge. I stopped, I stopped you know, scuba diving all the time. And I joined a company called, and, and oh, like finishing off the point, the job was really lonely. Everyone was wanting me, you know, was looking at me like, you know, uh, um, you know, basically, you know, make me rich. And I'm like, dude, I'm trying to get rich. Like, really? <laughs> like, like, so I felt responsible for everyone. And, the, you know, the, the, the product market fit wasn't really perfect. And it was, it was kind of tough. And so I kind of didn't want to be CEO anymore. And, and that's not that uncommon um, when, when um, the, especially if the company fails or if it was a rougher ride than you thought it would be. I kind of regret that now, that, that I should have just started another company immediately. Um, but the, at the time, I just wasn't interested. So I went to a company called Persistence. This was the next lesson in my career. This was not, th I joined this company. The company had absolutely great technology, but they were absolutely horrible at kind of positioning it and adapting it to a particular market. So I thought, great, I, I, I learned a lesson at Center View. I think I can do that, right? And so I joined the company as chief technology officer, but I was kind of like chief product officer. I kind of came in, took all the technology, adapted it to a new mar to a specific market, which in this case was finance. Um, so we, and um, the repriced it, repositioned it, everything, and we went from four million dollars a year in revenue to twenty million dollars a year in revenue over the next twelve months. So that so everything was right, thing grew, but it was the hardest twelve months. So the company had been around. The worst companies to to be a part of or to wind up starting are companies that neither fail nor succeed, when they just kind of bounce along. And they're neither big success, you know, successful, and or you know, it's it's like like if they're gonna die, just put you know, just put them out of misery, right? <laughs> so, and persistence was kind of this company, and people, and one of the reasons that's bad, besides the fact that without growth, things just kind of get less really stale, is people develop, other people develop a pretty kind of negative perception of the company, like, oh, I know that company, they've been around for years, you know, stuff like that. And that was the case of persistence. So I had to go out and I not only had to kind of adapt the price and things like that, it, it, it was like no one was bright eyed when I walked in the room to tell them what we do. They, they you know, it's like they were, you know, to use a bad analogy, it was like, you know, someone who had been around the block one too many times, right? <laughs> the, the, like no one was signed up for that. <laughs> and. Um, and it was, it was the hardest. I, I was there 18 months. The company went public before I left. Um, so, so I was involved in taking the company public because we grew a lot. And it was a time where you could, you know, you can get companies public that weren't a high, you know, if you were growing 400% a year, you, you were going to be able to take that company public. But it was really, really difficult. And I, I, I really highly advise don't do that. <laughs> so, just don't do that. And if you find yourself in a situation, there's a company right now, fab.com. So um, you guys, some of you may know about it, right? So fab.com started, it's another, I, I have six investors in Steelhouse. So another investor we have, Baroda Ventures, they funded fab.com. <clears throat> they funded fab.com as a gay social network, right? So guess what? Gay people are really social, and they don't need a social network. Like, they're out all the time, right? <laughs> so they, they, it, it wasn't going too well for the company. They took only six months to recognize that. And they had, by that time, developed a list of 150,000 people that had tried FAB as a gay dating site, I mean, a gay social network. And, um, and so then they thought, well, you know, let's do something else. Let's um, sell products to, to this audience. So they created what I think of as a gay crate and barrel, and the, uh, which is great, right? Everyone wants a gay friend to help you decorate your house. And, the, the, uh, and they did one million a month in revenue the first company, the first month they launched that. One million. They went from like a dying company to recognizing this is not going to work to let's flip this into selling products curated, um, you know, like and and did one million a month in the first month they launched it. That was like about a little less than two years ago. So that was July 
of 2011. By January of 2012, they were doing 10 million a month in revenue. So six months, they grew from zero to 10 million a month in revenue. Then they did the next round of funding. They did two rounds, they, they, they did a second round of funding. Um, I don't know what the valuation on it was, but it was like um, um, 20 million raised. Then they ju just raised, at a, at the, at the rumor has this, like an $800 million valuation as a private company. That's an example of like recognize, it's like you don't want to be in that middle state for too long. You don't want to be trying to make a business that is clearly not working, just trudging along. Imagine if they didn't do that, and it's now 18 months later, how miserable it would be to work there right now, and how wasted the talent would be focused on an idea that just doesn't, where the dogs are not eating the dog food. It just doesn't have product market fit. And um, so that, and, and that's essentially kind of what I joined when I joined Persistence, and I was able to pull it and, 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 and create value out of it, but I would never do that again, ever. Ever and would not advise it. And if you're in a, if you wind up in a company where to you, it there clearly is not a fit, and the team there, you're not recognizing that, and the team you're working with is not recognizing that or refusing to recognize it. I think you have to take an inventory as to whether it's the right choice. I'm not advising a jump show because startups are going to go through ups and downs. I'm just talking about how people respond to it. LinkedIn did not start as what it is today. Um, they even remotely. They, I think LinkedIn started as a way to exchange business cards electronically. That was the idea for LinkedIn. And, it's, and now it's the world's dominant, re really what it is, is the world's dominant recruiting engine is, 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 is what it is at the end of the day. And, the, and even big businesses transform. You know, Amazon, the, the, the idea for Amazon, it's funny how um, you can be very skewed by living on the coasts. Um, spend some time in Kentucky and Georgia and stuff like that, and you get a better understanding of what people, I think, um, through some personal experience, um, a better undis understanding of what people's needs are. You know, Amazon, um, when Amazon launched and there was a Barnes and Noble on every corner, I kind of thought, I don't see why you need an online bookstore. I can just go get a book until you go to like Cal you know, Katie's, Kentucky, and there's not a bookstore. <laughs> and, and, and there's not one anywhere close. And then it becomes obvious as to why that was a great idea. It becomes obvious why it's not just books. And, and then they've evolved the business now that Amazon doesn't, is not a retailer. They're a search engine for products. And they, and they happen to monetize a search engine by taking a cut of everything that's sold, which is brilliant. The, um, the, the, so, so that was kind of the, the, hey, John, you have to tell me if I'm taking too much time or anything. <laughs> so, um, so next, so I left there, um, did some more flying, the, um, the, because I really like flying, and I really like there was an airport right, I didn't fly in, but I really like that there was an airport right here. I, I just like feel good when I'm near an airport, something about that. And um, so, and I joined a company called Covalent. <clears throat> and Covalent was funded, I didn't kind of tell you the investors along the way, Covalent was funded by, um, I'll tell you, that, I mean, um, um, Centerview was funded by Hummer Winblad and US Venture Partners, who, and USVP is looking at the current round of funding. It's kind of funny, because it's like, it's like you're going home after 20 years, and like everyone's giving you hugs and stuff like that. It's kind of fun. And um, the um, persistence, we didn't have to raise money. And then um, Covell was funded by Sequoia Capital and um, Menlo Ventures. And I, people probably know, um, Menlo has some great investments. Sequoia has some really visible ones, like Google and um, Cisco and Oracle and some really, um, Amazon, no, they didn't fund Amazon. The, so some really, really visible investments. And, um, and so, um, Covalent was a great company. That company had a really big exit. It got acquired for $425 million um, by VMware. And the, um, the, the lesson I learned at that company um, was the danger in overcapitalizing, so taking too much money. So the last three startups I've been at, other than Steelhouse, which I founded, have raised a combined three companies, $240 million in venture capital. 
and that is a lot of capital. And when I started Steelhouse, I kind of was like, it shouldn't take that kind of capital to build a business. And I naively said, I think I can do it with a million and a half, and now we're 16 and a half million in, and about to raise another 15. But the, um, I, I, I was really determined to, to start Steelhouse, I'm gonna jump back to, the, to, to Covell in a second, with a small amount of capital. And, and, and actually, let me tell a lesson on Covell, and then I'll tell you why. So Covalent was founded by the engineers that wrote the Apache web server. So, the, the, so the, these are guys that wrote the infrastructure that, that initially powered the internet. And the idea behind, and I joined as head of engineering, and um, it was kind of interesting, just anecdotally, because all the engineers that wrote Apache live all over the world. And I wound up learning if you put them in one room, you get a world war. Yeah. And, <laughs> and you don't, they don't like, 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 it, like, like it was crazy. <laughs> and I, I almost literally had to start slapping some of them around to, to get them to work with each other. There was one guy that the, this leads to a lesson I learned. We had to do a layoff at Covalent. And this guy was so obnoxious that you know, if you can lay off a bunch of people together and say, "I'm sorry, dude, it's not my fault," you know, the, the whatever, the and lay them off together, it's a bit easier, right? Except this guy was so obnoxious, I didn't lay him off. I waited to the next day just so I could fire him, and the <laughs> and told him that, and he told me he respected me for that, so I kind of like that, and that's how like obnoxious he was. And the the it was it was kind of kind of cultural almost so from where he was, and um, so at Covalent is the dangers of overcapitalizing the company. The first round of funding was twenty one million dollars, <coughs> Series A, twenty one million, and um, the um, Jessica Alba has a company that's what twenty one million first round. So I'm a bit like hmm, the the um, but she does have the name and and what half a million followers on what on Twitter so. The, or two and a half million, I think. So um, we overcapitalized the company. The company took 21 million Series A, and it took it at like January of 2000, like the absolute worst time to take that amount of capital. It wasn't the worst time to start a company. It was actually a good time to start a company because it kind of cleared out a lot of competition, but it was a really bad time to go and overcapitalize and hire a lot of people because the entire ride at that company was 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 downhill, and the you know we had to do two rounds of lay and and the the we were selling the businesses we were basically selling kind of a more secure version of Apache built by the people who wrote Apache and all the services that go along with that and the man and the you know kind of management systems go along with that. And it was just a really tough market to sell into, despite how much these companies were interested, because they were on a downhill ride because the stock market crashed. And they say rising tides, you know, raises all boats. Well, a lowering tide does the opposite, right? And so, downward ride the whole time. Um, eventually, we need another more money, and it was another twenty-one million dollars came in. Um, and it was just, so we raised 42 million, and it was just, it, it was an unnecessarily tough ride. It, it, in other words, if we had capitalized the company differently, we could have had the same outcome, but we would have been on an upward trajectory the entire time rather than a downward trajectory the entire time. And part of the reason why overcapitalizing, this kind of connects back to what I was saying in Steelhouse, is that the, when you raise money like that, you're basically acting like you're Babe Ruth. You're pointing towards the outfield and saying, I'm, I'm saying, get out of the way, I'm about to knock this out of the park. And the, um, and the likelihood that you do that is not actually that high. And, and, but you have capitalized a company where that is the only way people can make money. And at Steelhouse, I was determined, like, like when you're CEO of a startup, it doesn't matter, it, it generally, unless it's the most horrible outcome, the CEO will make money. They call it a carve out. Like, we, if you get to a point where even if the company is not successful and we're gonna sell it to another company, well, someone's gotta get paid to do that. So the CEO is gonna get some money out of that, even if the VCs are losing money. Um, and so they call it carve out, but everyone else in the company is not gonna make anything. 
And so it's particularly egregious because it's like, you know, it's like you're buying a new car while everyone else is hoping to not lose their car, right? And the, um, so it's pretty bad. So at Steelhouse, I've been determined to make sure along the way that everyone in the company makes money from, from, from the equity as well as, as their, their cash cop. And I've told the team all along the way, I've said, I don't mind swinging for a home run. I just want to look at some pitches before I swing the bat. I want to see what we're looking at before we swing. And at this point, we're swinging for a home run. My, my goal is to take the company public. So, but that wasn't always the goal along the way in the three years that we've been doing this. And, and, and I think that um, if you see a company capitalize that, the most recent kind of glaring example of this is Color, where they overcapitalized didn't have product market fit, and just, you know, it's just a disaster. And by the way, it's a disaster funded by Sequoia Capital, so funded by one of the world's top VC firms. And um, I, I just think that's another thing to be learned. None of these lessons hold true all the time. They've just been the lessons I learned in my interpretation, uh, interpretation of them. And um, so, so that, that was 15 years in the Bay Area I've just described. Then um, I grew up in New York City. I always thought of San Francisco as a small town, so I kind of wanted to move to a bigger city. And I thought, why not move to the beach and move to LA? So I decided to move to LA. And um, it just so happened eHarmony was in LA. And they were still young, but kind of starting to take off. There was about, um, they were doing about, um, 30 million in revenue when I joined, maybe about 25 million in revenue, so not small. They were already profitable. Um, really interesting story. The guy you see in those ads, Neil Clark Warren, he is the founder of the company. He's a clinical psychologist. Um, his goal in creating that company, he basically, um, everyone's usually fascinated by Harmony. He, he basically did, for, he's a marriage counselor and clinical psychologist, and the idea for the company is he studied why marriages fail and su um, succeed and fail, and then thought, um, I can use those, I can turn, I can figure out the pattern, turn that into a questionnaire, and then help to match people um, based on, on creating compatibility. And, you know, various compatibility. It's not perfect. I mean, you, we like to say you have needs and wants, right? So a need is, uh, needs are some things that are deeply rooted, like your religious beliefs and your, your cultural values and things like that. Wants are physical attraction and stuff like that. And, and so eHarmony matches on needs. You still have to figure out the one. You still have to, you like women with attractive blue eyes. You still have to look for, you know, it doesn't match on that. Um, so um, what, there's no, the, the, the lesson at eHarmony, there aren't too many to tell because um, the company has been wildly successful. When I left, it was doing 300, almost 300 million a year. In revenue, I joined. There were about six engineers. I left. There were about seventy engineers on the team. The company spends one hundred and fifty million dollars a year on television advertising. Um, this time of year, no, not this time of year. Just between Christmas. So, so the the, the interesting reason why I left eHarmony one is a bit of a family-owned business, and that kind of gets tiring after a while, um, which is another lesson, by the way. <laughs> the um, and two, the the biggest days at eHarmony are the day after holidays. So you go home, and your grandma tells you you're fat, and tells you, why don't you meet a nice guy? And then you get depressed, and you go on eHarmony. And <laughs> it's true. And so after Christmas, the site lights up. After New Year's, the site. So, I, so after New Year's, it lights up. After Thanksgiving, it lights up. And so I never could actually be with my family the day after, you know, I, I had to work the day after Thanksgiving. You know, everyone gets Thursday and Friday off. No, not me. I got to work on Friday, right? And so, um, and Saturday and Sunday. So, so that's kind of eventually after four years, you kind of want to want to try something else. Um, really interesting business. Um, the first lesson is a really positive one. So eHarmony took two and a half million in venture capital. How crazy? How ridiculous that is. Neil is 81 years old, has never run a business. Um, his original idea was to send qu have, have questionnaires and put them in the mail. And you would fill it out and mail it back. And because he really had never used a computer, 
and a VC gave him two and a half million dollars. So the um, and Ben said, "Oh, by the way, I would do that on the internet if I was you." And so, <laughs> so <laughs> the um, and so they so they started and they at the time they said, "Okay, we're going to create a dating site." And they went out and created a dating site. And the whole problem with dating site, you need a network effect. Like you got you got to attract you know, community, and so they decided, let's launch in Dallas, and even though the company's in California, just because of the um, um, kind of, um, for whatever number of reasons, that they launched in Dallas. And things were not going well at all. And so the company was down to, this is a little bit before I got there, the company was down about, two, they had um, raised two and a half million, and were down about $200,000. And starting to lay off people, and you know, kind of, kind of all that disappointment that goes with that. And Neil went on a radio talk show in Dallas, and it really wasn't to talk about eHarmony. He's just kind of an interesting guy. And they start, and on the radio show, he started talking about marriage. And he started talking about, you know, how important marriage is, and how a, how a, a happy couple not only how a good relationship not only helps that couple and th those two people, it helps generations of people because their children tend to have happier relationships because they have role models for it and things like that. And he started talking about that. He didn't talk about dating. And within one week, the site went from 50 signups a day to 5,000 a day. And like you want to talk about being pulled out of like a, like a nosedive, like like this company was like um, six weeks away from dying, and and the and and it j just turned it around, and that's again I keep talking about product market fit, is because people didn't want to buy dating, they wanted to buy marriage, and that was the market that eHarmony sells into. It's not the same market that Match.com. For Dom, I mean, people definitely go to match on other sites and they hope to meet someone they marry, but eHarmony is all about marriage. And it was, a, and so, and then the next thing they did, which is kind of crazy, and so, so that change in the positioning, no change in the product, just changing how we describe the product, completely transformed the business and turned it into what, through the next step, which is that they started doing television advertising. Um, the reason they started doing TV ads um, is because um, they're sell you, you can sell sex in a picture, you can't sell marriage in a picture. It's, an emo it's emotional. And, the, the, and so you need a TV and radio to sell marriage. And so that's why, so, so eHarmony classically doesn't do a lot of online adverti banner advertising because it doesn't work for them. It works for when you can put attractive people in an ad and just you know, trigger some hormones. But the, um, and so they started doing television advertising and it worked really well. And um, there are very few internet companies that profitably do TV advertising. eHarmony is one of the few, if not the only one. And at peak season, when, when the December 26, when eHarmony starts their advertising, they start spending $750,000 a day on ads. And so, um, and, 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 they and we know they work because if you don't spend them that day, there's less traffic on the site and a lot less. Mm -hmm. Because the other thing, and maybe not so much now, um, at the time, people don't want to go to an online dating site, at least at the time. I think that's changed a lot. That, you know, it, they can easily be talked out of it, like stopping in the kitchen along the way, right? And, the, um, and so you needed to blanket the ads to really just keep them motivated to do it. So the first lesson I learned at, e, at eHarmony, which I kind of already knew but just saw in action in a way I'd never really seen before was that product market fit and how, the, how important the positioning is. I'd kind of done that at Persistence, but it just was transformational, um, the Eddie Harmony. The second lesson I learned is to, is to have your financial goals really clear. So eHarmony is a very profitable business, like hugely profitable. Like it spins off $5 million a month in free cash flow and, the, the, and things like that. But the, um, because it's so profitable, the company has a tendency to underinvest in new products. And single product companies tend to cap out. 
It's hard to grow indefinitely. So eHarmony is a high growth business that is growing a bit less now. And um, I'm being filmed, so I'm not sure I want to offer my opinion, but that's all right. And um, it, the company, it, it, it's like the company needs to choose. Do you want to be a cash cow, in which case you're producing tons of cash, just distribute it, and everyone would be happy as a clam. That's how like a Goldman Sachs used to be. Or do you want to be a growing, you know, a technology growth company, in which case you need to take some of those profits and you need to invest in new product. And, and, and you have to do that. The, um, one of the things um, my investors say now, Steelhouse, we are really aggressive about developing new products. And the um, and expanding into into new markets and things like that, and we're almost too aggressive about it. Um, some of my investors, it, it's like they come to board meetings and they just really don't know what to expect um, because this this and that's coming up by the way, John. <laughs> the um, and so um, so we're really aggressive about it. Most startups tend to be really trepid about it. Um, the, a lot of people say focus. To me, focus is not one thing, it's the right things. So it doesn't necessarily have to be one thing you focus on. It's just, the, we develop a lot of products, but they're behind one consistent goal. And, and so I, adv I advise that in terms of, um, once you have some traction, um, you know, if you don't have traction, then switch. That's what Fab does. If you do have traction and leverage it, I mean, everyone in the world wants to be the harmony of something up, except the harmony, which only wants to be the harmony of dating or marriage. So, so that's, and I love the company, by the way. I'm just giving, some, giving lessons from it. Um, the, um, the, the next company I was at was Rubicon Project. So, Rubicon Project is a company that's clearly overcapitalized, <laughs> um, but has been able to pull it off. They're doing $500 million a year in revenue um, after about five years in business, um, but have taken an absolute crazy ton of money in to get there. Um, the, there's n the, the, um, you know, the, the only difficulty at, Ru Rubicon's a great business, um, but it's a business that's very volume centered. So, and in other words, they do huge volume on the top line. It's not that profitable from a gross margin perspective. You know, the, 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 they're bringing revenue and there's a cost to bring it in. Um, but they're doing the classically, we'll make it up in volume. And, um, and it really works for them very successfully and the company is very successful, but it takes a lot of capital to get there. The, 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 because you just have to reach a certain scale to the point where the bottom line is big enough to cover all the people and systems and all that that takes to get there. Amazon is another really classic example of that, where it took a lot of time for Amazon to become profitable because their margins, gross margins at the time were really small. And, and, but they, you know, they just, so, so they just kept investing, 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 and they eventually reached that tipping point. That model is pretty hard to execute. If you can execute it, you're not gonna have a lot of competition, which is the flip side of that. Um, there are just not many people that have access to the amount of capital that it takes to, 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 to execute this kind of very high top line, small bottom line strategy. And, and then once you get there and you have all that market power, what Amazon has done is they transformed it into their essentially a product search engine. Now their margins are really great. I mean, I think that, that they, make, they make a ton of money because they don't have to ship anything. Um, they, they, everyone else is doing that. So um, there's not a positive and negative lesson in it. It's just something I learned. Um, and then, um, so now I'm at Steelhouse. And I don't quite know what the lessons are yet. You know, they're all saying you don't know what you don't know. And um, the, um, I know I really enjoy being CEO now. Um, I feel like I really know what I'm doing and, um, and, and have learned a lot of lessons along the way and are applying them and have a lot of fun um, applying them. Um, probably the hardest challenge at this company, this has been a fairly frictionless ride at this company. This, the things have just kind of really worked really well. Um, the hardest part is we have very ambitious plans and venture capitalists 
you know, it's hard enough to invest in one idea. They don't want to invest in five at the same time, right? And 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 I didn't tell them there was five at the same time, but that's <laughs> that that that's what the case is. And so we're executing a lot of things in parallel. We have a lot of you know plate spinning balls in the air, so to say, and the. Um, and that can be a bit challenging from a capital raising perspective because of this issue of VCs want one really clear boxed in you know, idea because that's the clearest path to, 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 um, um, to having a successful exit. You know, the, the, um, and so, so our earlier rounds of funding were a bit more challenging than the current round, which is kind of going very well. Um, but we have really supportive VCs, and, um, and quite frankly, we're executing really well. Um, so, and it's all the lessons I learned along the way in all the, all the companies I just described have really clearly led to how well this company um, Steelhouse is is going and, and executing, but there have been new ones. This company has more of a client client services involved than previous companies, and so we've learned a lot of things in that. So we're making new mistakes. We're just not making many old ones, and so it, ba it balances itself out. And so um, that's that's um, that's that's everything. That's 23 years. So that's everything I have to share. And I'm happy to take any question from anyone. Um, I was just wondering, um, so you talk about working at each individual uh, company. Um, and I was just wondering how you chose where to work along the way and what motivated you to go for certain companies versus others. I mean, early on, it was um, really what, mot what interested me. It was purely, I didn't think about stuff like, is this a good management team? And it, I didn't think like a like an investor. I just thought like this is an area I like and I'm, and I'm excited about and it's an interesting challenge. Um, later, about midway in my career, the track record in the first part of my career, I mean Oracle was lucky, and then the the then the track record later on, excuse me, became um, really explicit. I basically started acting as my own investor, except I was investing my time. And, and through all the lessons I had learned, it turns out I was making good investment decisions. And um, even at eHarmony, um, we bought a lot of technology. And at the time, I was buying technologies from some really young companies where, where their competitors were like, dude, aren't you afraid you're going to lose your job if this company goes out of business? And those companies, um, like three of them in particular, have had exits. It was a company called 3PAR. I got bought. I didn't invest it. I was just bought from it when the company had hardly any customers. They got bought for almost three billion dollars. I bought from a company Force Ten. They got bought for a billion dollars. I've got bought from a company called um, um, another company that got bought for eight hundred million. Like it, I just started to become a better investor in every decision I made, whether I'm buying from the company or picking the company I want to work at. And I became really thoughtful about it. Is kind of the answer. So. Um, so you just mentioned a formula, and I was wondering if you'd be willing or able to summarize that for us. Yeah, I mean, the formula is um, organic idea, obvious idea, um, the, the, you know, something that the you know, kind of um, big market or reasonable size market and really talented people. The, if a couple of them are your fan, friends, OK, but, but the, and just a lot of talent and you need capital. It is really hard to bootstrap businesses. It doesn't mean you shouldn't do it. As a matter of fact, even at Steelhouse, we bootstrapped it for a short while. But the, the, you know, it's, it's usually the company, it's just the wrong idea. You're forcing it and stuff like that. Uh, the, 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 and then you don't really have great, talented people in the company. The talented people will figure it out almost every time. But the, the, they, will, oh, that, they will overcome just about anything, just a really talented, well-managed group of people. And, so they, and, then, and, then, and then pour some capital on there. And you're going you're gonna to tend to do pretty well. So That was fantastic. Thank, Thank you so much. Thank you.